Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, this is Kunal here. He already introduced me uh, for a sort of informal introduction. Uh, anyways, um, a little about uh, myself. Uh, I'm uh, Kunal. I'm currently a developer at SoStrong. You would have probably met me just uh, outside the hall at our booth. Um, prior to SoStrong, I worked at ThoughtWorks uh, for about two years as an application developer. And uh, that's where my uh, journey with Go started. In fact, Embed, something that I'm going to talk about today, is my first serious implementation with Go. So, okay, let's start with Embed. What's Embed? Okay, Embed is uh, basically a, a embedded programming framework uh, entirely uh, written in Go. Okay, uh, I'm just curious, how many people have heard about Embed? Oh, okay, quite a few. <laughs> All right. So, Okay, I use the term embedded programming, right? So what's embedded programming? Um, let me try to explain uh, embedded programming in my own words. So take, a, uh, take an example of this device. Everyone knows what this is. It's a Raspberry Pi. It's a palm-sized computer, right? But there's a subtle difference between this and your desktop PC uh, or a desktop computer, right? So what a Raspberry Pi allows you to do is, uh, if you look over here, it provides these GPIO pins called general purpose input-output using which you can interface this board with other external devices like sensors or some actuators or probably another Raspberry Pi connected to this, right? So uh, what I'm trying to say is uh, something like this is usually embedded in a larger system and the whole system works as one, uh, one entire piece, right? So something like this is also called an embedded device. Now, the coding that you would do so that uh, Raspberry Pi would communicate with the outer system, you know, to get the final functionality done, that's called embedded programming. It's as simple as that. Okay, so with that clear, uh, a little story about uh, how we started uh, Embed. So back in ThoughtWorks, they had this uh, wonderful initiative called uh, Open Hardware. So uh, the basic idea was few uh, um, people get together. Uh, try to build some hardware projects, learn how to do them, and uh, make them open source, right? So me and a uh, few of my colleagues, uh, one is sitting here, uh, we plan to build a robotic car. We we're very excited about it, and obviously I'm from electronics, so I was too. Uh, this is the final product of that robotic car that you're seeing here. So uh, what we're planning to do is uh, build a simple car which, you know, you can control with uh, any of your mobile devices or smartphones which can connect to network and has the uh, accelerometer, you know, so that you can just tilt the phone or something. You can check out the video of uh, the board to find out. Okay, so um, we uh, uh, decided to use Raspberry Pi for this, and uh, because Raspberry Pi Pi was providing us with uh, almost everything that we needed, uh, it was a computer on its own, right? So we didn't really need to uh, build uh, interfacing hardware and all of that. So uh, I personally started with Python. I found out that there is some library uh, already out there to interact, uh, to use the GPI opens. But uh, so the same colleague who had, uh, who I had plans with to build a bot, uh, not just says, "Hey, there's this language called GoLang. Why not build um, something with that?" Right? I was like, "Oh no, one more language. Sorry, man, this is going to be tough." But uh, anyway, so he pointed me that. Uh, why don't you try something called tool.go, see how you feel about it, and let's then uh, take a decision. So I went back, uh, you know, completed about 20 slides of tool.go. It's a confession, I didn't complete it. <laughs> so uh, after that, I was like, okay, I didn't really find a reason why shouldn't we just experiment and, you know, try to do. So we first uh, looked for uh, existing implementations with Go. We did find one, but it was not really catering to what uh, we uh, needed to do. So we started um, coding. So any of uh, the hardware projects when you start, right? I'm sure uh, irrespective of the background that you guys come from, you would have tried to light a LED using one pin. Everyone, or, everyone would have done that. That's how we started Embed. We tried to control one of the GPIO pins. Um, uh, uh, and uh, that's basically how uh, Embed started. So that's the story of Embed. Okay, time for a uh, demo. So basically a, a week before the conference, uh, me and my friends uh, set up this very small uh, demo I'd like to show. Uh, this is just to explain how a 
typical embed application would look like, right? Okay, uh, what do we have here? I have a, I don't know if you can see this, but I have a glove with a sensor placed on it. I'm going to wear it. And uh, this is going to control a uh, two-dimensional plane, airplane, uh, in an app. Okay, let's uh, start this. I hope Murphy is not lurking around somewhere in the room. Yeah, it looks dangerous. Okay. So let me start this. Yeah. So I'll try. If you can look at this, I'm twisting my arm with the sensor on it, and it is sort of controlling the plane. Yeah. Okay, so who can point out what's terribly wrong with this plane? Well, obvious the propeller is not, the engine seems to be off. The landing gear is on the top, so it's, the background looks like the plane is almost reaching space, somehow, without the engines. Okay, anyways. So, okay, what was happening in, the, in this demo, right? So let's look at it. Uh, it's very simple. It's a very, very simple uh, setup. So you have a Raspberry Pi here. Uh, it's actually a Raspberry Pi 2, something which uh, we added support for probably a week back. Uh, the Raspberry Pi 2 is connected to a gyro sensor that was on the glove. So the gyro sensor basically gives you orientations you know, with respect to X, Y, Z axis. And uh, so it's communicating with Raspberry Pi using I2C. Uh, it's basically a hardware communication protocol. And now the Raspberry Pi is uh, uh, running a Go code. The embed code is actually running on the Raspberry Pi. And there, uh, I'm using uh, MangoS, which is a scalability protocol. It's something I'm trying to learn. That's why I used it. It's overkill here, but yeah. So it's sending uh, data that is getting from the sensor uh, through a TCP port. Now, next part is the app, right? Uh, one of my friend here who's sitting, Shantanu, uh, wrote this uh, small little cute app. Uh, in Qt. So what it does is uh, basically uses nano MSG, uh, pro, uh, this thing. Uh, nano MSG is, okay, uh, if I'm right, Mango is just a Go implementation of nano MSG, right? It uses nano MSG to listen on that TCP port, gets the data, and renders whatever you just saw there, right? The plane. So that's basically what's uh, happening at that demo. But the point of this uh, demo is, uh, I actually want to talk about the gist of embed. Why embed, right? People will argue that uh, embedded systems has been um, there from a long time. People have been using C to write embedded systems, and that performance is just great, right? That's true. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, uh, embed, uh, which is entirely written in Go, might not really match the performance that you would get in embedded code written completely in C, right? But uh, then why would someone use embed? So let's think. Uh, okay, uh, you, everyone has heard about uh, IoT, right? Internet of Things. So let's say that uh, you suddenly have this brilliant idea that something like Nest, something like what Nest has done, right? That I have this, 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 and uh, I have these sensors. I have some automation project, and uh, you want to, you know, you want to know if uh, your idea is does really work, right? So what you would uh, essentially start doing is. Uh, you would take something like a Raspberry Pi or any other development board out there. You will connect the few of the sensors, or you'll just try to build a, a system, a bare-bones system around it, and uh, try to see if the idea works. Now, in that case, you cannot just straight away start. I mean, people do uh, start away start by writing C uh, embedded code, right? But if you have something, uh, a hardware abstraction layer, which makes it very, very easy and simple to you know, use the sensor or uh, to communicate using one of the communication protocols or something like that, right? Then it makes your life much easier to not really think about the, what code you have to write, but it makes you think about what application I'm trying to build, right? What's the contraption I'm trying to build? You're trying to see if uh, it's feasible. So what I'm saying is Embed is basically a very good prototyping language, right? You, you want to prototype something. You can use Embed and uh, simply uh, use all the sensor packages, uh, you know, with, which uh, we have uh, given support for, 
and make a quick prototype just to prove that uh, your concept works. Like, then you can go to your production model wherein you know you uh, design a custom board. You obviously wouldn't use a Raspberry Pi on your production uh, uh, this thing, right? So uh, after that, you might uh, switch to writing the C code, embedded code, which is highly performant and all that. Yeah. So that's uh, about the demo. Okay. Let's move on to the next part of my talk. Uh, most of my talk from uh, uh, here, I'll try to focus on answering this question. So why and how uh, did we use Go? Okay. So why did uh, I use Go? First point, most important, easy to learn. So uh, I'm not really a, I was not really a software engineer, was. So I come from uh, electronics background. So uh, software coding was not really tough, right? But I always had this overhead of, uh, man, I have to learn this language, I have to learn how to use this, I have to learn how to write this. And in that mess, I would sometimes you know, lose track of what I'm actually trying to do. Right? But when it came to Go, it was, it was just like uh, very easy, just very, very easy. Right? Uh, in like about three, four days, I just saw uh, how to use uh, Go. I could write Go code. Obviously, the idioms and patterns and everything took its own time. Right? So uh, that was very easy. Uh, second point being the growing community of Gophers, right? So uh, as Embed was, uh, uh, as Embed came out of the open hardware initiative, we wanted it to be open source right from its inception. So uh, the huge community of Gophers that was out there when we started Embed, and even today. So we expected that if we make something like this open source, we would uh, expect a lot of people, you know, wanting to contribute to the uh, existing framework that we have written and it has been proved right till now because uh, we have had a lot of pull requests people are writing their own sensor packages within embed and the best part is when they write the code and you know when we look at the code in general it just doesn't feel that someone else has written this code it's just like uh, I, I don't know I think it's probably go which you know just uh, makes it look like the whole code looks same the idioms are all same okay uh, Cross-platform. So this is something very useful, uh, which have some, uh, which I've also used in this demo, right? So uh, 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 what you do is uh, you write your code on your Mac. You see if the code compiles. First thing is see uh, is uh, if it compiles, and it's Go, right? So usually uh, code which compiles most probably runs if you if you're not done uh, anything, you know, horribly wrong. So. Uh, what you do is, all you can say is your uh, Go architecture and Go OS, can, you can set it to the target device. So in this example, uh, the Raspberry Pi, the Go OS would be Linux because it's running uh, Raspbian, it's a flavor of Linux. And your Go Arch would be ARM, right? It's uh, uh, ARM 7 core. And, it, so, uh, and you can uh, uh, use the Go build with these environment variables. It gives you a single uh, uh, binary, single static binary, which runs on Raspberry Pi architecture. Actually, I should, uh, um, you know, mention Dave uh, Chen here because he's worked a lot on uh, providing this kind of a support. Okay, so yeah. Uh, next is uh, lots of features. So this is uh, uh, okay. The rest of my talk basically. Uh, lots of features in Go uh, just just made sense you know when we were uh, facing some of the design uh, considerations so we'll uh, take a look at uh, uh, two of them okay first one uh, my favorite interfaces so to explain about interfaces i'll uh, first talk about two things in uh, hardware servo so what's a servo uh, servo is just uh, very similar to a motor uh, but in case of a motor if you see the shaft keeps rotating at a certain rpm right but in case of a servo, the shaft doesn't just continuously rotate, but instead you can ask it to rotate and stay at a certain angle. Okay, and uh, it can, you know, stay at a range, let's say somewhere in 0 to 180 degree, or some servos can even do a full 360 degree, right? So that's basically a servo. How, uh, you would have seen um, servos being used in uh, robotic cars to, you know, provide the steering action, or in case of RC planes, uh, they, control, they control the surfaces which enables the plane to dive or climb and all that. Now, how does the servo work? A servo uh, takes input uh, PWM signal. So I said PWM signal, right? What's a PWM signal? It's simply a square wave whose pulse width, that's uh, this part, 
can be varied right you can say uh, like a normal square wave would be something uh, what people say 50% duty cycle because the high time and the low time are same so that's pulse width modulated signal okay so uh, now you know how a servo works so how did we uh, model servo in embed uh, let's look at that some code from now okay so we first have the pwm interface what's the pwm interface providing it's just providing a function to you which is uh, sorry uh, which is set microseconds in uh, so basically what set microseconds would do is uh, the function ex the function name tells it right it just sets the pulse width in terms of microseconds then we have the servo struct it has the input pwm and certain other things that servo would need okay and the only thing the servo exposes is a function called set angle so if you look at uh, i mean if you uh, look at the definition of servo that i just gave right this is all you would need all you need is provide some input to it and a hand and you need some kind of a handle to set the angle to which it uh, rotates to right but this is not really um, this much is not really telling how uh, we use the power of interfaces here right so to explain about that um, let's talk about pwm again so pwm is a signal and a signal can be uh, generated in you know n different ways there are multiple ways of generating a signal right but at the end uh, at the end it's just a pwm if you look at it a servo need not really know who is generating the pwm signal or how is the pwm signal being generated right all it needs is a handle on its pulse width so can it so that it can set its shaft angle to you know certain um, uh, value so uh, i'll actually take a few of the uh, samples that we support in embed so this is uh, one way of generating a pwm uh, using something called servo blaster servo blaster was uh, uh, again uh, another open source uh, uh, stuff that someone had written so what you do is you can actually generate a pwm a fairly okay pwm signal on any of the raspberry pi pins so what it basically does is it sets the pin to high then low uh, to certain time and all that but that's not uh, uh, really uh, efficient way of generating PWM, but it does work in some most of the cases. So this is one way of generating a PWM. So at the end, whatever we get is the PWM signal, right? Let's look at one more way of doing it. PCA 9685. So this is a ASIC. So ASIC uh, means uh, uh, application specific IC. So uh, what does PCA 9685 uh, uh, do? It's basically IC which has uh, 12 channels, and on each of the channel you can generate a PWM signal. So this is how you would, uh, this is how you would, you know, use uh, a simple uh, PCA9685 to generate a PWM. So the last, uh, uh, there's one more uh, important point here is setting the frequency. So I, I don't know, just people who uh, have done their hardware projects, uh, usually a server takes PWM signal with frequency of 50 hertz right so you set the frequency to 50 hertz and then the end uh, at the end what you use is uh, this package gives something called a server channel basically it's a pwm signal in one of those 12 channels so finally even here you're getting pwm but going back to the server struct we need this pwm here right so all uh, you need to do for any of those two pwms to be able to use as an input here is implement that method called set microseconds. So that that's how uh, simple it was. So let's say uh, there's one more person who has uh, found that hey, there's this one more IC which can generate a PWM signal, and he wrote an entire package in embed. All he has to do is expose one such method in that, apart from all the other methods called set microseconds, and it can automatically be used as an input to this server. So that's uh, I, I know in my eyes is just very 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 elegant and uh, using uh, if you look at the structure of pwm being a simple interface it just matches what uh, happens in the real world right so that's how uh, interfaces interfaces were used and this is how uh, i mean the final code would look like once you have the once you have the pwm you would just supply it to the new method which gives you the server and just use the set angle right as simple as that okay now, uh, in any Go talk, you're talking about features, and it'll be very incomplete if you don't talk about this. There's Go channels and uh, Go routines. Sorry, channels and Go routines. Okay. Um, 
how did we use uh, channels in GoReady? So to talk about this, I'll talk about uh, uh, sensors, right? So you saw one uh, sensor here which I was using. So what's the sensor? A uh, sensor basically takes a sample's data from its surrounding, like a temperature sensor. Try, a sensor tries to, uh, you know, sense temperature, the ambient temperature, and then convert it into some kind of a, a digital data that a computer can read. Right? That's simple. That's uh, as simple as it can get. So that's sensor. Now, in any of the embedded applications, what you would uh, usually do is you would get a data from the sensor. Then there is a controller which. Uh, reads that data, does some logic, then there's the actuator, which based on that logic, you know, does some actions. Like actuators are like motors or um, servos, for example, right? So there's a catch here. Um, every sensor takes a finite amount of time, you know, from uh, the sampling time that it sampled the data and the time at which it actually can give you that data in digital format, right? So essentially what I'm saying is, uh, for example, a temperature sensor, you ask the temperature sensor, hey, what's the ambient temperature? That's a blocking operation. Now, in real-time applications, right, you wouldn't really want, uh, want your execution to block at certain point and wait for a sensor to give you data and then continue, right? What you would essentially want to do is you would have multiple sensors, in fact, and whenever there is uh, data from a sensor, you want one block of code which deals with that sensor to execute, no matter what. So, how did we do that? Uh, I'll use one of the existing uh, examples. L3GD2 is the gyro sensor which is used in the demo. It gives you orientations. So it has something called uh, orientations, but see that it's not exported. It's just used internally in the package. Uh, this is a sort of a pattern that we've used in most of the sensors, by the way. Uh, this exposes a run method. Now, run is very interesting. What it does is a uh, few of the initial steps, right? It initializes the uh, sensor, does some calibration if required. And finally, that's the most interesting part. So it starts a go routine, wherein um, you can say that uh, the server is in, starts its acquisition loop, right? So it acquires data, uh, calculates it internally, then the, the final digital data is available. And whenever that is available, you send it on the orientations channel, right? So that's the orientation channel. But uh, you're using this sensor somewhere. But how would you get a hold on that? I've not exported that, right? So there's a method called, simple method called orientations, which just gives you a receive-only channel. Very, very close to what you would want in a real world, right? You're just asking something from the sensor. You never send something to the channel. Your sensor, you just say, can, you, you can just say the sensor to start acquiring, but after that, it's only receiving data from the sensor, right? So that's how it was. Let's see how uh, this is used. Uh, it's a two-slide uh, So uh, essentially here what I'm doing is I'm uh, using the uh, sample code from our uh, repository. So L3GD2 uh, uses I2C protocol to communicate. I had shown it in the block diagram. So you initialize uh, I2C. It gives you I2C, I uh, sorry, I2C bus. And you get a handle on the sensor, which I'll call gyro now, right? So that definitely is very important. I'll talk about it. So uh, after the execution is done, after it exits from the main loop, you close the sensor for, it's basically for cleanup operations, right? You saw that it's actually launching a go routine there within the package. You need to uh, stop or kill that go routine, right? And this is how you would actually use the data. So you'll say, uh, so yeah, gyro, uh, uh, start acquiring data. Now, obviously it gives you an error, which I'm not handled. <laughs> uh, uh, so that will start the acquisition loop. Now you get a handle on its receive-only channel that it was providing using the orientations. For temperature sensors, we will say temperature readings. For you know ambient light sensor, we'll say you know light uh, ambient light readings or something like that. That's the pattern we have followed. Uh, and here, what you do is you use this awesome for select pattern. So uh, a for select pattern is something that uh, I just explained how a sensor would be used, right? You see that if, if a sensor has something to give you, you just execute some block of code, which has to happen when the sensor has the data, right? And this is how it looks. So uh, when we were uh, uh, trying to model this, it, it didn't really you know, take us a lot of time to decide, hey, what do I use to do this? How do I do this? It just, you know, Go just literally talk to us that, hey, for select channels, go routines. So 
that's how uh, elegant uh, uses uh, i mean this is a very elegant usage of uh, go routines and channels so yeah these were the just uh, two of the things that uh, i used uh, in uh, embed i could have talked about uh, much more but these are my two personal favorites so okay moving on um, this is probably uh, near the end so what's the journey ahead for uh, uh, embed right so we want to support uh, more platforms so right now we support most of um, uh, the what raspberry pi all the models of raspberry pi including the most recent this raspberry pi 2 we uh, can add the driver code for more sensors there are like multiple multiple sensors right but we are trying to pick those sensors which are widely used trying to give support for them and uh, cover all the communication protocols we have done something like i2c uh, fairly completely we have a basic spi uh, working we need to complete we need to cover more uh, protocols like UART and uh, other stuff, right? Okay. So, oh, let's not go there. Uh, <laughs> I have a shameful plug to make here. Uh, because I'm from so strong, I have to do it. So, uh, it's just 10 seconds. So, uh, I'll talk a little bit about so strong. Uh, we are a startup based out of Bangalore. Uh, we basically uh, work on building an esports ecosystem. You guys can talk to us. Uh, we are at the board to know what uh, exactly does the esports ecosystem mean. But uh, uh, why here, right? So uh, we always strive to be on the cutting edge of technology, and that that's been uh, one of the reasons why we choose Go uh, to design our major, uh, to design our backend. We use tools like App Engine, Docker, etc. Do come talk to us. We have some really exciting stuff we've implemented with Go. Okay, finally. Thank you.